stop. It's hammer time. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Graphic Content. I'm your host, Ted Kendrick, and today we're going to be talking about Black Hammer. It's written by Jeff Lemire with art by Dean Ormston. This series is published by Dark Horse Comics, and it's gotten a lot of critical buzz over the last couple years. In 2017, it even won the Eisner for Best Series, so it's a big accomplishment. I've just read Volume 1, absolutely love the beginning of the series, and I look forward to reading more. This is basically Jeff Lemire's love letter to the Bronze Age of superheroes, creating his own original team of heroes that are basically homages to a lot of other popular characters that we've seen from DC and Marvel. One of the things I love about it is it really is my love letter to all the superhero comics I love since I was a kid till now, so you'll see allusions to all kinds of stuff from Arkham Asylum through Astro City that you mentioned, you know, it's a big influence on doing these spin-offs, so yeah. There's six main characters that are here in the story. The first one is Abe Smash. Abe Smash. Abraham Smash. Captain America type. He was scrawny, wanted to fight in the war, but the military, nobody would take him. So he ends up training with someone who teaches him how to punch and be strong, and ultimately he becomes a superhero. He even at one point fights a creature called Cthulhu, a guy named Lou who looks like a giant squid. We've also got Golden Gale, basic equivalent to uh, Shazam. Golden Gale says a magic word, uh, Z Z Zafram, something like that, Zafram. Nothing. Golden Gale, she says the magic word and is embodied for the power of a wizard and ends up becoming a different age than she normally is. For a while, when she's younger, she transforms into a kid, but as she grows older, she becomes an old woman, but when she transforms into the superhero entity, she is a nine-year-old kid again, and that uh, becomes really weird for her. When she's a teenager, she uh, decides not to stop crime just because she's self-conscious about her friends seeing her transform into a little girl. There's also Barbalian, very similar to uh, the Martian man hunter John Jones. This guy's name is Mark Marks. He's a shapeshifter, comes from Mars. He calls himself the warlord of Mars, but he's not really violent. He's actually pretty sympathetic. There's a lot of scenes where he and Golden Gale are sitting on a roof of the farmhouse together, just kind of brooding. Before I go too far and explain the rest of the characters, I should say the core of the story has all of these superheroes together on this farm, and they're all just trying to make a normal life together in this place that they've found themselves in. Ben alluded to that they're all here because there was this multiversal crisis sort of thing going on. They fought this creature called the Anti-God, which looks like a pastiche of Darkseid and Galactus. Ultimately, that brings them to this weird dimension where they found themselves stuck in small town America. They can't leave for some reason, and they're also in different forms than they are accustomed to. Golden Gale is literally stuck as her nine-year-old self, but she doesn't have any of the powers that comes with it. No, that's not true. She can fly. She's also stuck perpetually going to fourth grade. She keeps failing, acting up in class, she takes smoke breaks because she's so stressed at being stuck in this small town. They're all just at their wits end basically trying to get out of this town. Abe Smash, who is the patriarch of this makeshift superhero family, who's really just trying to uh, help everyone lead a normal life. Barbalian is there. Not only is he from Mars, but he's also gay, so he's struggling with the feelings that he has and it's never been reciprocated. When he came to Earth for the first time, he became a policeman and made a move on his partner that did not go well, so he's never really had a chance to explore that side of himself and now he's fallen in love with the local pastor and he started going to church and you can already kind of tell how that's not going to end well. <laughs> the three of them are there. We've also got Walkie Talkie who's a walking talking robot. He cooks dinner for them all. He reminds me a lot of Bender from Futurama. I'm not sure why and I don't quite understand his backstory yet but I know he's associated in some way with Colonel Weird who's the next guy we'll talk about. Colonel Weird is very much a like Adam Strange, Captain Comet type of character from like weird space tape or Bronze Age comic like that. Colonel Weird is uh, very much a ghost type character. He lives in this space called the Proto Realm, like protoplasm or something like that, and he kind of can drift in and out. Uh, he's not corporal anymore, so Colonel Weird goes in and out of this dimension. He's kind of able to see events unfold at the same time. It's not like Dr. Manhattan where he's unstuck through time. His consciousness can kind of shift around. So we see him pop in and out of the book, and then uh, there's one chapter where we kind of see it all play through his perspective. And he's a really interesting character because everyone's kind of convinced that he's losing it, going out of touch, becoming more of a ghost than a person. Because of that, he's asked to kind of stay away or keep to the shadows. The rest of the family don't really want him to be around and make things weird for them, which makes sense. His name is Colonel Weird. He's one of my favorite characters here so far because he's really sympathetic. He really just wants to be part of the family. No one's 
having him around. The last character in this makeshift group of people is Madame Butterfly, and she is essentially the embodiment of all things like Vertigo comics, like the, the edgy sort of horror aspect of things. Vertigo itself was inspired a lot of the, the House of Mystery, House of Secrets, horror anthology books that DC put out in the 70s. All these characters are um, the embodiment of some comics from the 70s. Madame Butterfly herself is essentially a witch. She protects this cabin in the woods. It's really similar to Jacob's cabin from Lost, if you get that reference. Went to this cabin because her young child passed away and she comes to this witch and asks her if there's anything she can do to bring the child back to life. And the witch agrees, but at a cost. Basically convinces Madame Butterfly to take her place as the protector of this cabin. She agrees because it'll bring her child back, but once she's brought to this cabin, she must stay there and protect it forever. And there's all these various doors in there that lead to different entities, different places. It seems to be a crossroads for different aspects of different dimensions. By the end of volume one, it starts to allude that she might even have some nefarious, um, nefarious goals <laughs> in terms of bringing all the characters here to this strange realm, trapping them in the city. It's not 100% sure that she did cause that, but they were basically fighting the anti-god. As soon as uh, they defeat him, there's a wave of white light and they all woke up in this place. It's been a, a long time. They've just been trying to, to make the, a new life for themselves here on this mysterious farm. Volume 1 ends with a character coming from the real world who lives in Spiral City. It's where all the superheroes used to operate. And this character's the daughter of a superhero called Black Hammer, who was kind of the leader of this group um, when they fought the anti-god. He was one of the best of them. He reminded me a lot of Steel because he carries a giant hammer. And they have the Black Hammer on the farm, but it's not revealed yet as to what actually happened to the original Black Hammer. He did wind up in the dimension with them, and um, I'm sure I'll learn pretty soon in the next volume what happened to his fate. But as far as volume one goes, his daughter is convinced that all these superheroes didn't die during this crisis. They're still out there somehow, and she's taken it upon herself to find them. Walkie Talkie the robot is the only one on the farm convinced that he's found a way to speak to the real world and try to find a way out. So he's been launching probes out of the farm back to planet Earth Earth and Spiral City in the attempt of contacting someone who can help them get home. And one of those probes makes its way to Black Hammer's daughter. Winds up finding them on this farm. She knows um, what Madame Butterfly did, whatever it is, she calls her out on it. But Madame Butterfly wipes her mind right as she arrives. So that's the end of volume one. We've got a new character, daughter of Black Hammer is here on the farm with them. I'm really looking forward to seeing if she can remember why she's there, if she knows her mission, knows what Madame Butterfly is up to. Uh, these are all uh, great questions that I have for myself as I catch up because this book's been out probably two or three years now and it's been ongoing. There's all these spin-offs that have come of it too. One of the favorite things for me is there's a character called Dr. Star who's very much like Starman from DC Comics. He's got a lightning rod sort of thing like that and in Black Hammer his name is Jimmy Robinson which is definitely a reference to James Robinson the writer of the 90s Starman comic for DC. That's one of my favorite comics and I really appreciate that reference here in the book. Dr. Star has his own spin-off comic that I'm looking forward to reading as well. But yeah, Black Hammer's got a huge universe that's building through it, and Jeff Lemire's been adding to it all the time. It's got a lot of miniseries coming out with Dark Horse that explore different realms of this universe. So I'm really interested to see more of Black Hammer, and I believe it might be uh, getting adapted to a TV show as well, as are a bunch of other Jeff Lemire books. He's one of my favorite comic creators working right now, I'm trying to read just about everything he writes. And when he writes and draws, it's uh, some amazing work. He's not drawing this. Again, that's Dean Ormston, but Jeff Lemire does a lot of the covers in here too, which are references to classic 70s comic books. That's Black Hammer. Go check it out. I'm sure it's available digitally. You can get it in your local stores. First volume is terrific. Yeah, cool. It's craft content. I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks. 10 years ago today, since they saved Spiral City and disappeared. To most, they don't seem real anymore. Like urban legends, ghost stories, but they were real. Abraham Slam, Golden Gale, Barbalian, and Colonel Weird, and my dad, Joseph Weber, the Black Hammer. I believe they're still out there, somewhere. And no matter what, I'm going to find them.